an analysis for Sierra Leone and basically showed that you know, just taxes alone that have been avoided on most of the, the minerals that have been thefted or extracted from the countries would have built health infrastructures that, that could have stopped Ebola in its tracks. So it's very easy to see historically how legacies of colonial and imperial extraction just set the stage for these huge, uh, these huge outbreaks. Aloha, everyone. My name is Maxine Roquette. I am a professor of law at the William S. Richardson School of Law here at the University of Hawaii. I'm also a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the senior advisor and co-founder of the Institute for Climate and Peace. I am extremely excited to uh, have this conversation today with Dr. Eugene Richardson. Uh, and it's a topic that's incredibly important and incredibly timely and will be uh, really anchored in the excellent book, which was just published, Epidemic Illusions, on the coloniality of global public health. Dr. Richardson is a physician anthropologist and an assistant professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. He previously served as the clinical lead for Partners in Health, where he continues to conduct research on the social epidemiology of Ebola virus disease. More recently, he was seconded to the Africa CDC to join their COVID-19 response. His overall focus is on biosocial approaches to epidemic disease prevention, containment, and treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa. As part of this effort, he is chair of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. Welcome, Jean, Dr. Richardson. Thanks so much. Welcome, Jean, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a delight to join you today. And uh, for those of you that don't know Maxine, she is a climate law and policy expert and one of my personal heroes slash heroines. So I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. Great, thank you, Jean. I am so much looking forward to it as well. So I, I think uh, you know you're doing so much vital work in the classroom and in the field, um, and I just want to first start out by asking, you know, what compelled you to write this book at this time? Well, I guess it has its roots way back, uh, you know, over well, almost 20 years ago now, where I, I actually lived in uh, Hawaii uh, in Waikiki, and I attended UH Manoa um, studying tropical medicine. Uh, and I used that training to move on to a uh, my first global health gig, I guess you could call it, uh, was in Sudan with Doctors Without Borders, uh, where I ran the lab uh, based on my you know microbiology training at UH. Um, and I ran the lab at a field hospital down in southern Sudan, and it was all one country at the time. But um, essentially, the South was an internal colony of of the Arab North, and. You know, I got to be friends with some of the um, some doctors down at a military garrison uh, nearby, and they said to me, uh, "You know, Doctors Without Borders is all part of Khartoum's plan and, and political strategy." And I said, oh, what, what, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, you know, we've actually you, you're taking care of people in these internally displaced persons camps, um, and they've been burnt out of villages in central Sudan uh, so that the Chinese could do oil exploration." Um, uh, you know, uh, without uh, people, you know, bombing the pipelines and whatnot. Um, and, and you take care of the people in these camps and, you know, you pay nurses and that nurse salary can take care of 40 extended family members. And so um, you actually manage these camps for us and, and keep the ranks of the SPLA or the Southern People's Liberation Army from, from swelling. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the enemy, that's the army we're, we're fighting against. So you're all part of our political strategy. But, Wow, you know, naive me. I, I didn't know that <laughs> politics were weaved into, uh, you know, aid and humanitarian work. And that that's, I think, was the where I started thinking about it and, and seeing it and then realizing that, you know, this it wasn't a, a, a novel thing that, you know, even as early as the 1960s, Kwame Nkrumah was talking about how aid is just a revolving door for, uh, you know, Global North countries giving a little with one hand to disguise what, what's coming out uh, with the right, and and so as I worked in in um, you know different environments, mostly in southern and, and western Africa, I started to see you know aid and humanitarian work as this double edged sword, as you know doing good work and saving lives, but at the same time um, you know um, doing ideological work. And the book is about how, you know, even beyond some of the, the aid and humanitarian work, um, it's, I, I saw it built into what we call public health science, such that 
um, you know, a lot of the work that we would think of as just kind of ob net objectively neutral uh, epidemiology or, or, or study of disease burdens actually does uh, a fair amount of ideological work. And so the idea in the different chapters is to kind of explore um, uh, how, how, this, how this occurs. Great, thanks. That's, that's a, a really interesting back, backdrop for all of this, uh, seeing what you've seen as a physician, but also you have the lens as an anthropologist, right? So how has being an anthropologist and a physician sort of given you unique insight to write a book like this one? Well, you know, you think of uh, anthropology and, and sociology as kind of contextualizing disciplines. Um, I guess I, I learned the tools of uh, critical theory and, um, um, you know, learning how to even do some of the epidemiological modeling myself so that I could see and understand uh, the language being used. So you could say my tribe that I studied was essentially the, you know, the, the, um, the WHO and the, and the epidemiological uh, groups of the, of the North. And they have their own language and they, and they have their own rituals. And so, uh, you know, the, I guess the training helped me kind of transcend my own involvement in those circles to sort of see it anew uh, and, and report on it. Wow, excellent. So, you, you know, I, I loved your use of sort of that that tri that lens, anthropological lens, to describe the tribes of the global north and particularly these epidemiological organizations. One of those organizations, um, you know, different, but perhaps within that that larger category, um, you've worked extensively with, which is the nonprofit healthcare organization Partners in Health. What sets the, the Partners in Health approach apart from the sort of more traditional charitable operation space in, in, in the wealthy countries uh, and, and what you've described in, in the book? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think Partners in Health has a, has a philosophy that, um, you know, when they go to work somewhere, they stay and, and, and the goal is to help build um, uh, you know, and strengthen health systems. And they do that in solidarity with people in, uh, in the country. And so you, you, know, you can see a lot of the, maybe the previous uh, paradigm for humanitarian work was more paternalistic coming in, doing what the, the technocrats thought was the, the right approach, um, and then just implementing. And I think Partners in Health really does a good job of, of actually partnering uh, with people on the ground and, and furthering the goals that, are, that people have there instead of ones that are developed in Geneva or New York or Boston. Um, and I will say though, you know, even though they're considered uh, a social justice organization, I think of them more as uh, tr uh, transitional justice. And, and maybe uh, in a bit we can talk some uh, about reparations, which I think is is really where we need to get to as far as our our, our idea of justice. But in the meantime, uh, the work of uh, Partners in Health and, and other groups like them, I think, uh, is is certainly worth supporting. Okay, so uh, I see that there's a lot of potential, especially the difference in approach, and it may actually seem radical. That, that approach in the context of you know sort of what is traditionally done in these in these organizations that you're describing, but you know, just say a little bit more about how how the sort of partners in health approach fits into the potential for transformation and whether or not the organization itself goes far enough um, mm -hmm. as you see it. Um, and yes, we will we will address the reparations element of it, but thinking specifically about what the capacities are currently mm -hmm. um, in terms of reaching that transformation, does does partners in health go go far enough? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you can use uh, the example of, um, I actually worked for both uh, Doctors Without Borders and uh, Partners in Health in Sierra Leone very, very shortly, <laughs> a very short stint with uh, Doctors Without Borders before moving over to Partners in Health. And, and their approach is described well. Um, Randy Packard has a book on the history of global health, and he dedicates the, con uh, the conclusion to um, kind of juxtaposing these two groups. Um, and you know both are both are necessary. Both do great work, but it seems the pendulum is has is still too far over in this kind of emergency uh, paradigm where it's just people show up, the the you know do some work on an outbreak and then they're off uh, once you know transmission stops. Even though there's a lot of suffering that goes on after the last case has been identified, and there's plenty of health system strengthening to do to prevent the, the whole 
uh, the whole thing from happening again. And so I think swinging the pendulum back to more, um, to, to involvement in strengthening health systems instead of just responding to everyone in an emergency fashion is a better way to transition to, um, to a form of justice that in the end is more reparative. Okay. Well, so, and, and before we, we sort of dig into that, um, when you were working with MSF in Sierra Leone, right, um, there is a pretty great example of, of the things that, how things can fall apart, if you will, right? And um, I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that work, that time in Sierra Leone and DRC, working with the two, you know, in the context of two large Ebola outbreaks. Um, how did you see the sort of colonial imperial, imperial legacies that you describe in your book set the stage for these uh, two large outbreaks? Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to notice when you get there um, how rich these countries are. You know, Sierra Leone, the, the district I was working in, um, is very rich in diamonds. That the movie Blood Diamond was actually about the Kono district in, in Sierra Leone. And then DRC itself uh, with, you know, gold, diamonds, cobalt, all of it. Extremely rich countries that, you know, we did an analysis for Sierra Leone and basically showed that, you know, just taxes alone that have been avoided on most of the, the minerals that have been thefted or extracted from the countries would have built health infrastructures that, that could have stopped Ebola in its tracks. So it's very easy to see historically how legacies of colonial and imperial extraction just set the stage for these huge, uh, these huge outbreaks. And you know, the, those, those sort of uh, colonial frameworks or, or ways of seeing the world or ways of being in the world you know, continued up to this present day. So. You know, in, in Kailaun, uh, where the MSF Ebola treatment unit was, although, you know, really it's questionable whether the word treatment should be there, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let us put in IVs. Um, so patients are coming in shock and, you know, we weren't allowed to fluid resuscitate them because um, I guess they, they thought it was too dangerous potentially for uh, us and the, the, all that PPE, we might stick ourselves, et cetera. Um, and, and Partners in Health came with a mandate to really be as aggressive as we could about treatment. And Paul Farmer has a, a book out uh, just recently called Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, and he really does an amazing job of, of tracing the, the actual colonial history of this kind of containment over care paradigm of just going into a place and, and using isolation and quarantine strategy, strategies instead of actual med medical tools on hand to care for patients. And so that was another way uh, I think um, you know, Partners in Health was uh, transformative in, in focusing on care. And then once we, the outbreak uh, started in DRC in uh, 2018, I think the, the dedication to care was there. WHO, OLIMA had great setups for, uh, for really prioritizing as high a level of care for patients as possible. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, that further explanation. There were a couple moments in the book that I was completely jaw dropped. And I have to say, one of them was in the description of sort of the, the, the refusal to give treatment, the kinds of treatment that's known to be effective, simply because of sort of this pre-existing condition that the region has of you know, incapacity, right? And that means that you can't actually provide, um, provide this, the, the treatment that's known to work, that has, uh, that has the, the possibility of sort of um, say demystifying, but certainly uh, socializing Ebola in a way that makes it less of a, a monstrous disease that needs to be contained in the entire region. So I actually found that to be incredibly striking in it, and it did tell the story of the ways in which imperial legacies are, uh, are muted in these you know, sort of contemporary retelling. When you talk about um, uh, the colonial and imperial legacy, it's really nested within a sort of larger concept of coloniality, right? I mean, the subtitle of your, of your book is on the coloniality of global public health. So can you explain for us what that means and how we can use that as sort of a, a, the, the term coloniality as a backdrop or a context setting for all of the other things that need to happen moving forward? Sure, you know, the, the, the framework uh, coloniality was developed um, by some scholars in, in uh, South America, notably Anibal Quijano from uh, Peru. And it essentially states that, you know, the, the colonial frameworks that were put in place over a period of 450 years, um, they've actually transcended independence of, of former colonies, that, um, so, such that we still live under this same colonial power matrix. 
Um, and after uh, uh, independence, we've essentially moved from a, a, an era of uh, global colonialism to a current period of global coloniality. Um, another uh, scholar, uh, Sabelo Ndlovu from uh, South Africa, um, he describes uh, uh, the term as, you know, despite, despite um, the celebration of decolonization as a milestone in, in African history, um, that the continent has not managed to free itself from epistemological colonization inscribed on the continent and its people by mission and secular schools, religious denominations, and other institutions that carried Western cultural imperialism. And so what I tried to do with the book is, is to demonstrate that actually, you know, um, to add to that list, we could throw on schools of public health and schools of medicine that seemingly do objectively neutral work in, in trying to understand disease burdens, but actually carry a, a fair amount of Western uh, cultural imperialism with them. And by exposing that, I think we can find, um, you know, different ways of, of interpreting social phenomena, ways that actually support ideas of justice instead of ways that continue to support, you know, neoliberal views of the world, continue to, um, you know, at least whitewash or or not challenge the extraction, uh, the, the extractive continues uh, activities that continue to this day. Okay, so that that makes a, I think that makes a lot a lot of sense, and it would be helpful, I, I think, for all of us to hear a little bit more about sort of specific examples uh, of the ways in which modern public health science is sort of engaging intimately with this coloniality or is, you know, sort of engaging within this context of coloniality. If you can give us a specific example from the work that you've done, I think that will help really illustrate what, what you mean to convey. Sure, you know, one of the examples that I use in the book um, is of a Harvard School of Public Health study that um, examined why there was such a huge outbreak in, in DRC at the, the time I was there. And essentially what they, um, what they published in a, in a very you know, high impact journal was that, um, you know, the people had their own ignorance. They had, um, misinfor you know, their belief in misinformation, their refusal to accept Ebola as something real, uh, to blame for, um, uh, for the, you know, explosive spread in that particular outbreak. Um, and that to me, you know, uh, while it's true enough in the, in the sense that they gathered these facts that people said these things, um, you know, what it does is support an intervention that, um, that, uh, you know, furthers aid, uh, you know, uh, NGOs coming in and, and helping, um, not only to treat patients, but to kind of convince people that it's real to set up, uh, WhatsApp groups and focus discussions and all these things, all these things to like, rationally convince people that, oh, you know, everything you're hearing on WhatsApp is misinformation. If only you would believe it was real and take the vaccine, there wouldn't be any problems. Um, another way of looking at it uh, is actually, you know, furthering the discussion with people, you know, why, are, why do you think it's not real? Or why do you think that it's a U.S. bioweapon? And then you, then you start to understand that, you know, it's not lost on anybody there that you know, their ancestors had their hands cut off by, you know, King Leopold and the, and the Belgians for, uh, you know, not collecting enough rubber and that there was further, further uh, extractive activities under uh, when they were a Belgian colony. And that, you know, the Belgium, uh, that Belgium and the U.S. colluded in the assassination of their first prime minister and Patrice Lumumba. And that after that, the U.S. installed a, a Cold War puppet dictator, paid him peanuts essentially enough to run the country while our, while our companies were able to, uh, you know, extract what they wanted from the East. Um, and that type of extraction continues to this day. You know, the Anglo gold Ashanti, um, by one report, uh, gets 93% of the wealth out of the ground to, to the global North. Um, and so it's not lost on people that th these are the legacies they're dealing with. And so, um, you know, what sounds like ignorance is actually, more of a, cr a critique is like a, it's a historical consciousness. It's a, it's kind of a structured disposition towards eluding these centuries of depredation that they've experienced. You know, why all of a sudden after 200 years is the white man showing up in a Jeep, uh, someone that's not on the take when every single other person has been. 
Um, and so if you look at it like that and you understand their interpretation as not one of ignorance, but as more of, uh, of critique of historical consciousness, then the, the intervention is not, um, you know, more aid or sitting down and trying to change people's minds. It's actually repair of those legacies or reparations. Right. That makes that that does make sense. And I would I would say, I mean, I want to put first a pin in the larger conversation about sort of COVID and vaccine hesitancy um, and you know some of the more sort of recent uh, press that we've seen about how that discuss, discourse is sort of mismatched with what's actually happening on the ground, say, in the United States and communities of color. But before we get there, I do want to, to sort of delve a little bit more deeply um, into what it would look like, again, using that sort of prior case study of this sort of wise critique or this wise hesitant, this hesitancy that's born of wisdom, not just these centuries old uh, assaults, but, but contemporaneous assaults, right, whether within communities or, or, or proximate communities. What would the alternative look like, right? Based on what you described, what would sort of an anti-racist or anti-colonial intervention look like in response to say the, the Ebola outbreaks in Guinea and Congo that are happening currently? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, taking seriously uh, an anti-colonial approach would focus on uh, reparative means. And so I, I would bring this up with, with colleagues when I was there, you know, well, um, if you know how how if only 10 percent of the people took the vaccine in a in a village we visited how can we get the other 90 percent to do it and i'd say things like oh all right well why don't we set aside 100 million dollars from belgium uh, to pay people to take the vaccine and that 100 million has to be committed as part of, as the first installment of a several trillion reparations package that the you know the country is due um and, you know, I get laughed out of the room, of course. But I think that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, one of our colleagues uh, brought, stated that, you know, if you think of the 1800s as, a, as kind of a century of abolition um, and the 1900s as a century of development and human rights discourse, then maybe the 2000s can be a, a century of, of reparative justice. And, you know, we're seeing those movements all around the world, even especially in the U.S., um, regarding um, uh, descendants of, of people enslaved in the U.S. Great. That's a, that's a that's a great a great example, I and mean, it's one of uh, a question of feasibility that I think we'll um, we'll we'll want to sort of delve more deeply into when we think about the context of public health and and reparations as well. You know, I, I, I'd like to you know get uh, get some uh, uh, your input on it too. I mean. These the the crises there have the long historical roots and and you know they they need to be addressed in, immediately on their own terms, but you know my understanding of uh, you know cascading environmental crises suggests that the external pressures mean we're we're much more time bound than than we even realize and sort of in a very unprecedented way, and I think this dovetails well with your work on uh, climate justice and climate reparations and so. I'm wondering if you could speak about some of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely relevant. And uh, as you know, I, I, I think of climate change as the sort of the, the, the context within which the 21st century will play out, you know, whether it's the reparative century uh, or otherwise. I, um, and, and we can see that, um, you know, when we treat it as sort of this isolated issue and without contextualizing it, without understanding its colonial history and the coloniality of climate uh, in its um, in its presentation, <laughs> right in our in our you know real world experience, as well as in our sort of the geopolitics and the the global economy elements of it, we see that um, there's a deep, long history. And you know, my research has long been. Uh, looking at the ways in which racial hierarchy and environmental degradation have actually um, served as mutual accelerants for for at least five centuries, and and you know the first indications of that are actually uh, perceptible in our measures of temperature and carbon concentration. You know, 500 years ago, when Europeans first set sail, right when we saw the great dying, uh, you know, uh, uh, result in the loss of life of of. You know, 50 plus million uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas, that, that exposure to disease, warfare, enslavement actually uh, decimated communities to, to the effect of, of reforestation in the Americas and an actual sequestration of carbon to the extent that we saw cooling and dipping of global temperatures. There's been a fingerprint in terms of our, you know, sort of our, our um, 
our, our colonial, the colonial exploits, uh, the fingerprints have been on, on our, our, our global uh, atmosphere uh, over, over centuries and in, 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 in the stratigraphy as well as we see that the Anthropocene actually could be marked arguably by that first encounter. And researchers, you know, researchers are really looking at those times as these you know, great dying or the great divergence as a moment in our history and our relationship with the environment. And now, you know, in the 21st century, we're at a moment of these cascading crises in which, uh, you know, biodiversity collapse and climate change, among other things, are colliding in a way of making um, vulnerable communities, so-called frontline communities, even more exposed to the kinds of threats that, um, that include public health threats as well as other incapacities. And so global north, global south relationships have really could also be described as sort of the over-consuming and the consumed, uh, over-extracting and, and extracted. Um, communities means that we have um, billions of people that are, uh, are, 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 are going to continue to suffer from the kinds of um, uh, exposures that you're describing and the sort of haphazard and ham-handed responses that um, sort of global organizations of all stripes <laughs> are using to, to, uh, to, to remedy the situation. And again, those things are happening absent that understanding of the, how colonial relationships, uh, racial hierarchy have actually established or actually set up communities to be less capable of responding to the impacts of climate change. So there's a sort of a, a double threat of actually being more exposed by, by virtue of just sort of natural uh, phenomenon, but also being uh, ill-equipped because of the ravages of, and the, the, the effects of, 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 of colonialism and its aftermath, including the very things you're talking about um, in the book, the structural adjustment programs, the contemporary um, sort of isolated approaches to problem solving, to, to problem definition and then problem solving as well. So there's a lot of overlap here, um, and uh, I, I think we we would uh, benefit as well from that reparative approach, as you know, uh, which could help get everyone sort of better uh, better situated to respond. So, <laughs> six, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, thank you for the question. I, um, I I do think that the in in some ways you are one can be. Um, Overwhelmed by the extent to which the, the sort of the, the problem has um, has extended and throughout is sort of the tendrils of of, of these of, of coloniality. I mean, it is a context, so so that's going to be pretty comprehensive. Um, but in the same way, in the same way that we can diagnose the problems that we see in the context of climate justice and what you're describing means that actually we uh, are, are better situated to identify the, the root problems um, than we would be if we were not having these kinds of conversations. I mean, um, one of the things that I, you know, just to sort of to pivot back to, to some of the um, public health issues, and I know that there is uncertainty about, say, our extractives are, uh, and mining and exposures to, to pandemics like the one that we're experiencing. And so I won't necessarily ask you to go down the rabbit hole of proving that up, but I do want to, to sort of pivot to COVID so we can, to, so we can understand what's, what we're seeing. Um, first, do you have any, I'm gonna go a little bit off script here and just sort of you know, invite you to, to say a little bit more about what the relationship might be, might or may not be, between COVID and sort of contemporary extraction, and if it's relevant. Mm -hmm. And then, then we can talk about what some of the responses have looked like and whether or not, uh, what they would look like if they were done better and in a more reparative fashion. So first, what's, what's the relationship, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, there's a lot of ways to look at it. And the, the, the most striking thing to me about the, the pandemic has been this, um, this vaccine apartheid that we're witnessing. Um, you know, the, the, the main problem is that we don't have enough vaccines for, for people in the world, even though we have enough, uh, even though we have effective vaccines. Um, and the idea that, um, we would, uh, uh prioritize our, you know, continuing to protect intellectual property, um, with the, with the result that you know we don't allow manufacturing centers in the global south to get the technology to learn it and to produce enough vaccines to really contain the outbreak is counterproductive in so many ways i mean one 
it's it's just immoral <laughs> uh, when when people are dying and we have the the technology to save them. Um, you know, two, it's it's uh, economically counterproductive because if half the world is uh, economies are going to tank because they still have to go through lockdowns and all of that, that affects the the countries that are vaccinating their populations. Uh, it's counterproductive epidemiologically because variants that um, that um, form in the in unvaccinated places are just going to come to and escape people's uh, you know immune responses in vaccinated places, and so you know uh, so to me this is kind of the the you know ethical question of our day, um, and South Africa and India have brought this to the WTO and and ask for waivers on the intellectual property. And there's, of course, Global North, uh, global north pushback. Um, and it's usually to protect you know, the, the profits of the pharmaceutical industries. Um, but uh, you know, what, what you were getting at earlier, I, I think it all stems from the idea that you know, um, like the lack of historical contextualization. I mean, these, even though you know, certain companies came up with the final product. Oftentimes they're using technologies that were publicly funded or discovered, you know, or experimented on or tested on people in the global South. And so, you know, if you have a relational view of the world, um, it's easy to see that, you know, these, these products that are built on a history of extraction, right, that allows you to be in a position to have, uh, you know, more technology or, or greater resources that um, if you produce something with that, it, you don't own it uh, because you know, it, it, it's, it's been created uh, while you're standing on the backs of, of, of you know, generations of people. And so again, it brings into the, uh, to the discussion this idea of reparations that, um, that you know, even if people don't want to share what they think is, is theirs, that um, if you, if you took the reparative approach that these countries, you know, say UK has been, uh, Utsa Panayak has shown that UK stole 45 trillion from, uh, from India during colonization. If you see that there are those debts to be paid and that our current advances are, are based on, on those, uh, you know, uh, the, those investments, so to speak, then paying back the investments means uh, an equity strategy can be part of a reparations plan. It can be the start of of a reparations plan so um interestingly i the what you're describing with respect to ip uh is also very relevant in the term in terms of thinking about climate uh mm -hmm. and some of the mitigation opportunities and it's literally tripping it up um to to sort of make an, an awful pun to the trips agreement and the international arrangements that actually are you know sort of significant impediments to the sharing of, of an important um, you know, collectively divined, right, exactly. um, um, technologies. And so, I, again, I think that we have this interesting uh, parallel in which, you know, there is a, in this incredible complexity and the comprehensiveness is almost hard to fathom, but the sort of the, 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 the instrumentalities are, are, are so similar between um, some of these major thorny issues. You were talking about, I, I think it's probably appropriate just to take, to pause for a moment and just sort of make sure that we have a sort of a baseline understanding of what we you mean by reparations, the term, mm -hmm. and uh, and then and then I'd like to you know again situate that within the con the context of say vaccine rollout. So just just uh, uh, briefly encapsulate what you've been sharing with us, just so that we have uh, shared terms moving forward. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, repar reparations can be described in a lot of ways. I think one helpful way is to look at it as you know acknowledgement of of uh, grievance, um, you know, redress. Of this grievance and then and then closure, and it can take v variety of forms. So you know, uh, scholars we work with in the U.S. are uh, you know uh, demanding a, an eradication of the wealth gap between, say, a black and, and white Americans as as a form of reparations. Other colleagues in South Africa are working more on land reform. So you know, taking back land from white farmers that stole it originally and redistributing among black citizens. So the redress can take a variety of forms, um, but it's you know, usually the idea is that it is developed by, um, you know, by those that would be receiving it. You know, the, the ones, the, the people with, um, uh, that have experienced the injustice are, are the ones who should be, you know, 
uh, telling what the redress should look like, of course. Thank you for that that definition. And I think uh, some public health officials, at least, would see themselves uh, as allies or sort of a part of that uh, a sort of reparative project. Um, and, and some might actually push back a bit on how you have uh, set up what may seem a sort of um, a set of critiques of of the innocent, right, or at least well-meaning professionals who are devoting their lives to improving public health. What's your response to that critique, and uh, and and what is the pushback that you've received? Because I imagine you have. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think it's important to uh, for the, for what I'm doing um, is to see not the the people as colonialists or or racists, you know. I mean, what, but the work, uh, you know, what it does in the world. Um, and so, for example, I was looking at the, uh, the IHME or the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, um, their COVID models from, you know, last spring. And this is a group that's received over $600 million from the Gates Foundation alone and, you know, really is at the forefront of publishing about disease burdens such that, you know, people even question whether, um, you know, it's ethical to publish some of these things because they they really capture the public imagination about you know, how we should be interpreting how people suffer. And so their COVID models, essentially, um, you know, they, were, they were quite wrong. Their forecasts were wrong. Um, and the, the plummeting numbers that they predict were actually used by the Trump administration to show that they were doing good work. So they were easily co-opted for ideological uh, purposes. But you could also see the work that they did in the world that, that these models did as racist because, you know, they, they offer these interventions like wearing masks and, um, you know, social distancing and things like that, which, you know, if people followed, uh, sure, we could reduce from 10 million infections to 1 million infections. But in both those scenarios, we'd still have these racial disparities where, you know, uh, black people dying at one and a half times the rate of white people. And so, Rarely in these models do you see interventions into risk structure. You see interventions um, into um, you know, racial justice interventions. And, and if you use Ibram Kendi's, defini Kendi's definition of, of uh, you know, racist policies or racist analyses, you know, if they're just continuing status quo relations of inequality, then that's really doing racist work. Only if you are um, you know, reducing these disparities are you doing anti-racist work. And so we came up with um, a plan to do what you know we thought were uh, anti-racist models in in, um, in sort of forecasting what um, COVID transmission would look like in the U.S. if reparations had been paid to Black American descendants of people enslaved in the U.S. And we found that um, the that intervention paid you know five ten years ago could have reduced. The COVID outbreak across races in the U.S. by 30 to 60 percent. Um, you know, not just in the group that received the reparations, but you know, the, the way infections work is that you know the the highest risk group often determines the the population dynamics. So if you intervene in the high risk group, there's benefits across the board. And so we published that, um, got an, you know an article in CNN, and then the hate mail ensued, like awful racist hate mail. Um, you know, the, received by the co-authors, uh, by the, you know, all the co-authors of the study, even, you know, to this day, and it was published, uh, you know, over a month ago, six weeks ago. That's, uh, that's, that's disturbing to hear uh, that this, you know, sort of in, in some ways, um, a hopeful message that comes from the work that you were doing is met with such uh, vitriol. What does that mean if that's the response? What does that mean for for the possibilities of repair and transformation on a larger scale, right? I mean, what, what, what do the critique look like and how optimistic are you about the possibility in this climate uh, for the kinds of shifts that we need to see? Yeah, I mean, you know, some of the emails would say things like, you know, how, how dare you divide us like this uh, by, you know, saying that current, uh, uh, current population should pay for something that happened 200 years ago. And the response is that it's not for just what happened 200 years ago, it's what's happening up until this day in the form of, you know, post slavery, Jim Crow, lethal policing, hyper incarceration, you know, redlining, um, uh, you know, differences in, in credit uh, and, and housing access. I mean, um, and so, um, 
you know, the, the divide is there it's, and we're trying to repair the divide. So to be accused of dividing is like flipping things on its head. It made me realize that um, in this sort of culture wars that the dialogue um, uh, amongst the polarized groups, it, uh, it made me question how successful it could be and, and made me realize that I think real work, grassroots work, work towards, you know, reparations legislation, you know, things that um, that have the, the force of law, like th that's going to be necessary, that I don't know that um, people in coffee shops are going to solve it with uh, their discussions, that we really need to work towards, um, you know, frameworks in law that, uh, that enact these programs. Right. And, and as you mentioned at the, at, at the beginning of our conversation, there's some early indication that at least uh, while I think probably national and uh, international work on this would be necessary in terms of really impactful and appropriate reparations uh, that we're seeing at least in small pockets the uh, that, that exercise being conducted and we can sort of guess at what you know we can we can track that to see whether or not it will be truly effective mm -hmm. um, you know I, I think there's still going to be outstanding questions about uh, both the the pushback from your from your public health colleagues but also um, what the the, t the tenor of the conversation will look like given the responses that you got. But one other thing that was, you know, critical to, to, to address, I think, is the fact that you, you know, as a white man at Harvard, uh, writing a book in MIT Press on coloniality is an interesting position from which to, you know, conduct this kind of critique. Yeah. Um, tell me more about that. What is, you know, how do we, how do we trust what you're saying? How do we, you know? Exactly. I mean, forward? Right. Uh, I, th I think it's important for you know, me to realize that I'm not doing the age old anthropological um, uh, mission of, of going somewhere and representing people's ex experiences. You know? So my, my work uh, you know, is essentially not, the goal is not to represent what it's like to experience uh, anti-Black racism or to experience epistemic violence. It's more about to report on how harmers do their harm because I'm in that group. I roll in the Harvards, the World Banks, the WHOs, the elite institutions, and I, I think I'm, uh, I have a privileged position to witness how harmers do their harm, and so to report on this, I guess maybe is a form of weaponizing my privilege. But um, if uh, you know, I'm always. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always trying to focus on how to be a good ally. And so, you know, in my work at the Africa CDC, you know, my goal is just to, you know, how can I be of, of use and not, I think the, you know, McKinsey approach, which is how can we, you know, use our technical expertise to, uh, to show you how to solve the problems you bring to us. So it, it is a, a difficult, um, uh, um, you know, tightrope, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning every day. And I, I think, um, you know, uh, it's, it's been, uh, you know, working in the, the groups like this Lancet commission on reparations and uh, working with scholars from the global South, that's been kind of the, the, you know, greatest reward of, of this kind of academic career. So it isn't MIT Press. You are a professor, a medical a professor of medicine at, at Harvard, right. uh, but your approach, your monograph, is anything but the sort of the, the typical monograph of a technical expert, right? Um, you have really approached this in a in a in a very um, unconventional way and deviate in all sorts of ways. Um, some that readers may find puzzling, some humorous, um, but there's you know uh, an incredible amount to learn from it. But the question I have for you as a writer is why this approach and who influenced you. I, what, you know, what was the goal in, in using these innovations in this form? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, um, you know, if you start from, an, uh, uh, from a position of relationality rather than focused individualism, then, you, you know, you see that your ideas are not your ideas. And, and really, for me, I'm just, I think, presenting in novel form uh, things that have been discussed and, and, and written by people like, you know, Franz Fanon and, uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Edward Said and Toni Morrison and, uh, Nancy Frazier, um, Paul Farmer, Cornel West, you know, these are some of my, um, idea heroes. And, um, I think I was just trying to use the book as a, um, an experimental way of, of conveying, uh, some of their insights, 
um, and conveying some of the insights of people I've worked with on the ground that, you know, there really is a pluriversal ways of interpreting social phenomena and that the one that we agree on in social science happens to be just the one that the, the often, you know, supports uh, either global North ideologies or, or elite positions, but that there's so much to learn um, from once, once you're able to, you know, transcend the baggage of the, of the, uh, you know, American Academy, um, there, there's a whole world to learn, uh, you know, to learn from, and there's a whole world, you know, to be one. Great marks. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, that's wonderful. I, I mean, we, I think we share a lot of the same, we definitely share a lot of the same, uh, influences. And I, I know, yeah, tell, I, I'd like to hear some of yours too. But. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I know for myself, I mean, there was a lot of head nodding going on, um, and Kruma and, uh, and what you're describing, you know, it, and actually the marriage of that with the sort of typical, uh, Hippocratic oath, uh, and chromatic oath that you describe in the book, which is really an excellent way of understanding how we can have a position, um, an orientation towards doing less harm <laughs> in really meaningful ways. Um, that resonates as well, in the, and certainly in the climate justice work and some of the, 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 the core approaches that we need to be addressing. Uh, Fana, Wretched of the Earth, Wangari Matai as a, a, a woman, a, an African woman who was doing incredible work uh, for women, by women, um, planting trees and understanding that relationship, um, relationality and in, in, in action. Um, Bob Bullard is the, you know, known as sort of a, the godfather uh, of environmental justice, the father of environmental justice. Uh, he's done some incredible work um, in helping us understand what the environment really means, which is much broader than it is, um, that it is in a sort of circumscribed understanding, Western understandings of the environment. It's really where we live, work, and play, which is just about everything that we engage in and the, the, the incredible need for health in those spaces. Colleagues of mine like Carmen Gonzalez and Usha Natarajan are doing excellent work in understanding the relationship between you know, our long colonial history through to, you know, the, the understanding the differences in the development of international investment law, investment law versus international climate law and why the two <laughs> diverge so dramatically and why one seems to prevail to this day to all of our detriment. And so I, um, I, I agree with you. Uh, this is, we're sort of taking ingredients um, that have been harvested by so many fantastic um, thinkers and um, heart-led uh, influencers that I, uh, I'm grateful to them and they try to cook up something interesting for us to, to really uh, nourish ourselves with. So thank you, Jean, so much for uh, this conversation. Thank you for your research and for pushing us to think differently, not just about the content, but about how we consume that content, how we understand it and integrate it. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I, I did, again, uh, as I've mentioned uh, in other sp spaces, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for viewing our conversation. I also want to thank our sponsors uh, for the Better Tomorrow series, uh, the University of Hawaii, the Hawaii Community Foundation, and Kamehameha Schools. Mm -hmm.